here. Um, the first graph I would like to show you is the graph of Trinidad and Tobago's natural gas reserves. And this is the 3P graph. So the red being the proven, the blue being the probable, and the green being the possible. And what is instructive, if I could find the pointer, right? Um, what is instructive is this part of the graph right here. We've seen a, a steady decline in our 3P reserves, and there's been an arrest in that decline in the years 2011, 2010, I would say 2011, 2012. And uh, this is what a proven graph looks like. And again, you see the trend is a bit of stabilization has come into our proven reserves in the years 2011 and 2012. It's been relatively flat here in this period, and that means the companies are investing and they are replacing reserves as they produce. So we produce at about 1.4 trillion cubic feet of gas per year, and that has to be replaced every year. And just replacing 1.4 trillion cubic feet of gas is a tremendous effort. So I believe that the incentives are beginning to bear some fruit, um, and that may well be a good proof that it's taking um, effect. So the incentives of the last four years have set the stage for the future. And again, that's what we're here to talk about, the future. Right? The impact of these incentives have already begun to be realized in increased drilling. Um, and somewhere in my slide back, there is a graph with a rig days. And rig days is the metric the ministry uses to gauge drilling activity. So you see that it was a decline, a sharp decline in rig days between 2008, 2009, most likely due to the global financial crisis. Um, and there's been an increase in rig days generally um, from 2010 and onwards. And I expect the 2014 rig days to go slightly above 2013, given the amount of drilling that we're having here. Exploration drilling. At the recently concluded energy conference, I announced the award of three land blocks to range resources, lease operators limited, and touchstone. These three blocks together with the Trinma license and seven and the seven de existing deep water PSCs will lead to the drilling of 31 exploration wells. Um, and these 31 wells are contractual obligations that must be executed over the next eight years. So that's 31 mandatory exploration wells in the next eight years. And that number could go as high as 53 exploration wells when you consider the optional phases in the PSC. The PSC's work programs are designed with phase one, phase two, and phase three. So those 31 wells are part of phase one, which is mandatory. And as I said, the additional 22 could come based on the success of phase one. The most exciting area of drilling must be Trinidad and Tobago Deep Atlantic Area Block 5, which is where BHP is the operator. At the energy conference, BHP gave some insight into that block. The structure they are seeing there were the limitations that they have of 2D seismic, or that's, that's what they have, 2D seismic, is three times the footprint of one of their producing fields in the Gulf of Mexico. And I hope I could find that slide. This is it here. Um, this is borrowed from Vincent Pereira's presentation at the energy conference, and I want us to all remember this slide. That's Trinidad and Tobago here. This is BHP's existing Angostura field. Um, and this is generally where Trinidad and Tobago Deep Atlantic Area Block 5 is. And this is the structure they're seeing there. They've given a, a name to it. Um, Color will explain the source and origin of the name. Pegleg used to be a pirate. That's what I'm told. Um, the name of a pirate. Um, and this, these are three of their fields in the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico is a place with some pretty big oil fields, right? Um, and this is the footprint they are seeing here. It's, and this is the, this, these are, and this is the scale. So BHP is seeing something pretty big in block five. Um, and you can see there are other structures also around it. And that is why block five Trinidad and Tobago Deep Atlantic Area Block 5 was the most sought after block in the 2012 deep water bid round. 
I turn a bit now to BP and their OBC seismic. BP, of course, and I must pause to, to say, um, the recently submitted EITI report did a couple things. So there was only one major story coming out of that report because that report made it very clear who the country's largest taxpayer was, or the country's largest contributor, not just taxes, royalties, and so on. The country's largest contributor to revenue is BP. And BP contributes roughly between 20 to 25 cents on every dollar of government revenue. So their future in Trinidad and Tobago is very important. In the last two years, BP has conducted its ocean bottom cable seismic survey of its Columbus Basin acreage. And let's hear what David Renwick, who is our energy sage in the Business Express, has to say about the OBC seismic and the future. And he goes on to write in his column, the OBC seismic employed integrated simultaneous source technology, which uses multiple vessels to collect data and yields much improved imaging of its subsurface. It was the first time the BP group had applied that technology outside of the test environment. It was applied in Trinidad. The triumphant outcome, according to Renwick, um, to lengthen the life of the gas industry in Trinidad and Tobago. In the words of Keith Bali, BPTT's Vice President for Resources, that's Keith Bali's word, company president Norman Christie enthusiastically confirms this, and David sometimes uses some nice adjectives. What the OBC seismic has told us, he declares, is that not even looking, not even looking deeper, there is probably much more in our existing shallow acreage than we would have realized before. When we fully interpret the seismic, we may be even seeing something in the deeper horizons. So what's the point? The point is that the application of new technology, OBCS, OBC seismic, which stands for Ocean Bottom Cable Seismic, to a well-known mature province, the Columbus Basin, will more than likely lead to the discovery of more gas reserves in Trinidad and Tobago. In terms of talking about the future, and I'll come to the future, a bit some of the projects of BP, um, enhanced oil recovery. Trinidad and Tobago is a mature oil and gas province. We produce some 3.5 billion barrels of oil in the last 106 years, and over 1 billion of that 3.5 came from land. Most of the Trinidad's reservoirs produce via what they call solution gas drive, for which primary recovery is approximately 15%. So it means that if a reservoir had 100 million barrels of oil, oil initially in place, the recovery factor is 15%. 85% of that oil stays in the ground. 15% is recovered by primary mechanisms, which means the oil is produced from its own pressure. It's equivalent to the blowing into orchard park and some juice comes out because it's under pressure and when the pressure diminishes, no more juice flows out of the orchard park. So that's what has happened. Um, EOR, that's using a very simple example. EOR techniques can be systematically deployed to increase recovery by 5%. This represents additional production volumes of approximately 600 million barrels of oil. So if we were to increase recovery by just 5% from that 15%, it represents another 600 million barrels of oil, which is in itself a giant oil field. Wide-scale wide EOR has been limited to steam flooding of shallow heavy oil reservoirs, but there is potential for expanding existing steam floods and applications of water flooding and CO2 flooding to deeper reservoirs. And I mentioned CO2 because Another energy sage in Trinidad and Tobago, I don't like to use the word energy expert because there's no such thing. Another energy sage in Trinidad and Tobago, Krishna Prasad, is a great believer in CO2 flood. And that is simply pumping CO2 down into reservoirs and pushing oil out. And the NGC, together with Petrotrin, in collaboration with Petrotrin, they've been charged with the responsibility of coming up with a, doing a feasibility study for capturing CO2 from Point Lisas piping it down to the oil fields to aid in carbon dioxide flood. So I see CO2, steam, and water flood as being major parts of our energy future um, in Trinidad and Tobago. 
I wanted to talk a bit about Petrotrin because Petrotrin has been, and please appreciate, we can't talk about everything today. Um, Petrotrin, the state oil company, is 21 years old. In summary, the company has approximately 409,000 acres under its direct control through its land, Trinmar, and North Marine exploration and production licenses, making Petrotrin one of the largest landowners in Trinidad and Tobago. In its land and Trinmar operations for fiscal 2012, a total of 2,216 wells won production, comprising 1,886 on land and 330 in Trinmar. It is involved in 24 joint ventures with other companies. It is one of the country's major employers with 4,300 permanent employees and approximately 1,200 temporary workers on its payroll. I say that to give an appreciation for the footprint of Petrotrin in the national economy. The company also supports a pensioner base, believe it or not, um, of about some 5,400 persons. In 2013, Petrotrin made a loss. That loss was due to the economic performance of the refinery. If we strip out, as the company has done, the exploration and production performance from the refinery performance, the picture emerges. The exploration and production side of Petrotrin, or what we call the upstream, is profitable. The refining and marketing side is not. And that is not for any reason other than the reason I'm going to explain just now. But in 2013, those two, exploration and production being profitable, and R&M, refining and marketing, making a loss, almost canceled out each other and resulted in a net loss of 22 million Trinidad Tobago dollars, a small loss. All the analyses show, all the analyses show that moving forward into the future, the return to profitability at Petrotrin will be driven by increasing oil production. And that was the very first thing I said two years, um, some three years ago, when I became Minister of Energy, that the number one goal had to be increasing oil production. Increasing oil production going forward is going to be Petrotrin's number one strategic priority. The company, and I would say, um, because there are many people who feel that we don't have a plan, we do have a plan, the company has submitted to me and I have reviewed its 2014 to 2018 strategic plan. Its near-term opportunities for oil production would come from the reactivation of the Southwest Soldado field, which is cu currently in train, the continued development of the Jubilee field, and I say continued development because there is already oil production coming from the Jubilee field, and increased drilling and EOR on land, EOR being enhanced oil recovery on land, and in Trinma. Petrotrin's forward-looking CapEx profile to the year 2018 is biased towards the upstream. The focus of the company is going to be increasing oil production because increasing oil production has the greatest impact on the profitability of the company. Moving into the future, what's the, what about the refinery? And I'll talk a bit about the refinery because Senator Razia lives in the refinery, as she has told me. Sorry to sell out where you're living. <laughs> Moving into the future, the refinery will, be, will continue to be impacted by low margins. And we have no control over the margins. That's a feature of external forces. As a consequence of the shale oil, not shale gas, as a consequence of the shale oil revolution in the United States, the refineries in the United States have now become a lot more competitive, and I'll explain why. By law, the United States cannot export crude oil, and that's a criteria of U.S. history, going back to the 1970s and the time of the embargo. That means that there is a buildup of inventory of crude oil in the United States, and when there's a buildup of inventory in anything, the economists will tell you the price goes down. So that's why there's a big differential between the West Texas Intermediate Price and the Brent North Sea Price, and that differential sometimes got as big as $20. It means that the U.S. refineries are being fed with cheaper oil compared to the rest of the refineries in the rest of the world. They are also being fed with natural gas, cheaper natural gas, and natural gas is used by the refineries as a primary source of energy to crack the crude. Natural gas 
is 30% of refinery OPEX, that's operating expenditure, in the United States, but is 60% of refinery OPEX, operating expenditure, in Europe. It means, therefore, that U.S. refineries, compared to European refineries, compared to our refinery in Trinidad and Tobago, they are much more competitive. The result is that the United States has become a net exporter of petroleum products. By petroleum products, we mean gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and so on. And that is impacting negatively on refining mar refinery margins all around the world. Bloomberg, on February 5, 2014, re reported that French refineries reported losses of 700 million euros in 2013. Globally, there is also excess refining capacity, and this is projected to stay that way in the future. In recent years, we have seen the closure of two refineries right around us. The refinery in the U.S. Virgin Islands, which was a Hess refinery, and the Valero refinery in Aruba have both shut down. Going forward to 2025, refining is going to be a difficult business to be in if you are outside of the United States. The critical success factor for improving the economics of our own refinery here in Trinidad and Tobago is access to crude, to equity crude or indigenous crude. Currently, about 27% of our refinery's crude oil diet comes from Trinidad and Tobago. 73% is imported. I don't think the average man on the street is aware that our refinery has a capacity of 165,000 165,000 barrels of oil per day, of which we supply from our oil fields and Trinma 45,000, about 27%. The other critical issue, and of course the economics have shown that the more the diet shifts to locally supply crude, the better the economics. Because when Petrotrin has to purchase crude at 73% on the world market, they have to pay world market prices whereas they could produce crude um, from their fields at a price lower than world market prices. The other critical issue impacting the refinery is the gloomy future of residual fuel oil. The major and residual fuel oil, I think it was what was washed up on the, that was the culprit in La Brie. Um, residual fuel oil, demand for residual fuel oil in the world is going to fall. Um, and that is a consequence of a shift globally in power generation from fuel oil to natural gas. In Trinidad and Tobago, all our power is generated from natural gas. Where the, where the power plants use residual fuel oil, they use it for backup in case the natural gas supply shuts down. So when you drive on Rison Road, you see power gen on one side. Across the road, there's a huge tank, and it's marked Bunker C fuel. That's fuel oil. Power plants around the world are shifting away from diesel and fuel oil, and they're shifting towards natural gas. So demand for residual fuel oil in the world is going to generally fall. But Petrotrin, when they refine a barrel of crude oil, one third of that crude oil becomes fuel oil. So let's look at some of the strategies going forward to increase value at the company. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, increasing the quantity of equity crude is absolutely critical to the survival of the company. Leveraging on location to grow volumes in existing premium markets and capture new markets is important. Aggressive cost management and increased, increased operations efficiency. And last but not least, implementation of a bottom of the barrel solution to convert that fuel oil into higher value products and thereby increase the value of the, of the fuel oil. It should be noted that Petrotrin, ladies and gentlemen, still supplies the demand for petroleum products in the Caribbean, and they supply about 50% of that demand in the Caribbean. The other major supplier being Venezuela under the Petro-Carib arrangement. In the period 2014 to 2018, and we try to stretch out into the future, Petrotrin will spend 16 billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars um, as capital expenditure, of which 11.3 or 71% will be spent on the upstream as the company invests to increase its oil production, and that will positively increase refinery margins. The other aspect of the energy sector is the midstream. 
and what is the future of the midstream sector? First of all, what is the midstream sector? And we had a rather robust intellectual argument in the ministry about what is midstream and what is downstream, because there's some gray area, right? Andrew and I and Frank wrestled a bit on that. Um, the midstream sector for purposes, for our purposes in this lecture includes natural gas transmission and the LNG industry. Some may argue that it also includes the refinery, but I've chosen to keep the refinery in a separate section on Petrotrin for simplicity in this lecture. So we start with the LNG industry. The LNG industry in this country is 15 years old. The first shipment of LNG left these shores in Point Fortin in April 1999, exactly 15 years ago. In the period between 1999 and December 2013, 2,844 LNG cargoes have been exported from these shores to some 21 countries. That's a very impressive piece of information for a small country like Trinidad and Tobago. The justification, ladies and gentlemen, for the LNG project, for the LNG project in 1990 was demand from the United States for natural gas and to a lesser extent Spain. In the case of the United States, that no longer applies. And I just want to give some idea of what our LNG business looks like. Um, this is now percentage LNG export by volumes, uh, by region in the year 2013. And there are some folks here from Atlantic, and I want to recognize um, Arlene Chow. She's somewhere in the crowd, chief operating officer. And this is where the bulk of our liquefied natural gas now heads to. And that's South America, 44%. Uh, the Americas, which includes Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, as well as the United States, and uh, Europe and Asia being the other major source um, destinations. And this is it by, by country. And you can see at the bottom here the three major um, countries in South America, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina, that now buy our liquefied natural gas, and you can see the United States of America down now to 10.56%. Um, and many believe that number will continue to decline into the future. So that's where we are right now with LNG. Uh, a bit of our LNG is making its way as far as Japan and Korea and China. The surge, the surge in US shale gas production over the last five years has, of course, transformed North America from an LNG importer into a new frontier for LNG exports. On a global scale, the US has the largest queue of LNG projects lined up. Many years ago, when I started to go to energy conferences, they used to put up this map of the United States, and they used to show all the, the map would show all the regasification terminals. Minister Enel, former Minister Enel, you remember that map? Yeah. They would show all the regasification terminals that were planned in the United States, and we would say, wow, the United States is going to import so much natural gas, and there's going to be so much demand for what we have at Point Fortin. That map has now flipped, right? Um, the US has the largest queue of projects, and these are liquefaction projects. According to the International Gas Union, as of 2014, 28 liquefaction projects have been proposed, and they represent 285 million tons per annum in terms of capacity. Now, what does that number mean? Qatar, Qatar's capacity is 77 million tons per annum. So these 28 projects, when you do the summation of each project's individual capacity, is almost four times what Qatar is actually producing right now. We in Trinidad Tobago, we do our 15.3. That's our capacity at Point Fortin. The US government, now not all those 28 projects have been approved. Some of them have been approved. Some are awaiting approval. The US government is keen to control the project build-out for fear that a massive growth in LNG exports could impact on domestic prices and supply and could result in overbuild. There is also a very powerful lobby in the United States uh, led by Dow Chemicals that is against the export of natural gas. And I just put that in there for thought. The first export project in the United States, which is the Chenier, um, Chenier Energy project in Sabine Pass, Louisiana is scheduled to start in the year 2015. So um, in one year from now, the country that was the 
primary market for our liquefied natural gas will itself become an exporter. But as you could see from the pie chart before, we're not terribly worried because our natural gas is finding its way all over the world and the US just accounts for about 10.56% now. So the Chenier project, this is Chenier's train one and train two in Sabine Pass, Louisiana is expected to start next year. So we know for sure that by the year 2025, the United States will become a major exporter of liquefied natural gas. So what is the future of our humble 15.3 million tons per annum in point 14? Well, I want to postulate that once we can supply or continue to supply it with reasonably priced natural gas, it will continue to exist. I believe the multinationals are of the same view. In 2013, Shell acquired Repsol's shares in Atlantic for the lion's share of the over six billion US dollars they spent on Repsol's assets. Why would Shell spend that kind of money if the LNG business in Trinidad and Tobago would be wiped out by American LNG exports? Shell obviously knows something. The other partners in Atlantic have signaled an interest to commence talks around a new train one contract which expires in 2018. The strength of the LNG industry in Trinidad and Tobago, in my view, rests on the fact that our four